So I plan to take no more than an hour this evening for talking about the book and answering questions, well, primarily answering questions. Like I need uh, questions in order to have anything to say. And uh, maybe after um, 45 minutes or an hour, then I'll hang around a bit for the formal book signing, if anybody has a book to be signed. And I don't want to minimize that time because considering this crowd, where I know almost everybody in the audience for 30 to 40 years, and you also know each other, and this is more of a social event like a 50-year high school reunion. <laughs> uh, I have to wonder what it is about this book that could actually bring us together. And I think something about the 50-year interval, it's not only uh, the passage of a certain amount of time demands um, memory, but also <clears throat> the themes of the 1960s seem to be coming up again. They're coming up again as they came up then for more or less unknown reasons. And it's those unknown reasons that I have been pursuing, uh, especially during these past two months since the book launch event at the Blitzer Gallery in, in August. So I wanted to proceed primarily through questions and answers, but to give you a break, I'm going to start with two questions from myself. Uh, the official title of this talk is Hip Santa Cruz and the Chaos Revolution. So the two questions I want to start with are why should we be interested in Hip Santa Cruz? And also, what is the Chaos Revolution? So I'll, I'll start with the Chaos Revolution. Sorry about that. <clears throat> now, there is a book entitled um, 1968, that's the title. And it's a rather thick book. It's an entire book about this one year. And on the back cover of the book, it says, this book is the most important, uh, about the most important year that ever happened, and no year this important will ever happen again, and so on. <laughs> There's a whole list of, of, of things that happened uh, in California, in the United States, in Europe, and, and globally. Um, for me, it was an important year because that's the year I moved to Santa Cruz. I moved from Princeton University to UC Santa Cruz. I moved from Princeton, New Jersey to Santa Cruz, California. And I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And in all my days and my many uh, transformations, this would be, I should think, the largest transformation or dislocation that, uh, that happened in my life. Astrologically, it somehow coincided with the, all these other big things that happened in, in 1968. Uh, at Princeton, before I moved, <coughs> I was studying uh, a chaos theory I gave a, a huge uh, course at Princeton University in Chaos Theory in 1966. Uh, the lecture notes became a book, my first book. And uh, in that course, I encountered for the first time the idea of a re revolution, a revolution in the sciences, a revolution in mathematics. And I came to understand uh, chaos theory as representing a major revolution in the history of mathematics. So after coming to Santa Cruz, this uh, little known subject of chaos theory had a brief 
uh, window of fame for a, a year or two. Uh, it was all in the news and then, of course, forgotten. But while the subject was hot, I was besieged by journalists asking me, what is chaos theory and why should we care? How did it happen and is it really a revolution, etc., etc.? Because they naturally wondered, is it news or isn't it? And why not ask the, uh, the mathematicians involved? So in trying to answer these questions, I had to dig out the history of my subject. Um, most of which I had lived through. So just a question of collecting notes and uh, talking to people. And eventually, uh, talking to people became a book like this book on Hip Santa Cruz. The question on the origin of chaos theory became a book called uh, The Chaos Avant-Garde, a book of first-person accounts of the pioneers who actually initiated and carried through that revolution, which happened to coincide with the 1960s. So in looking at history, I'm not uh, even an amateur historian, but I had to look at the data and consider it in my own point of view, which was the point of view of chaos theory. So chaos theory looking at itself, the chaos theory not very adequately named, is about complex dynamical systems. These are a class of mathematical models which are similar somehow in their structure to systems that we live within, which are also called complex dynamical systems. In the mathematical version of complex dynamical systems, there is extensive experience obtained through computer simulation in which it turned out the chief characteristic feature of these mathematical systems is discontinuity, major transformation, what the mathematicians called bifurcation. So I saw the onset of chaos theory as a bifurcation in the history of mathematics and radiating outward into the sciences, the arts, and popular society coincided with a bifurcation or major social transformation that took place in the 1960s. Yes. So, uh, I think within a year or two of that book, The Chaos Avant-Garde, a collection of first-person accounts by participants in this mathematical bifurcation. Within a couple of years, it occurred to me uh, somehow to apply this whole technology to the hip culture of Santa Cruz. And I began what I call the Santa Cruz Hip History Project. This is a, just a group of people, maybe 50 or so people, several of whom are here today, who experienced uh, Santa Cruz in the 1960s or uh, related events nearby, for example, in, in Palo Alto, Los Gatos, and so on. And uh, this group of people participated in an oral history project in which people took turns telling their stories, sitting in a circle of 15, 20 or more people, telling their story into a recording device like this one. They used to be bigger. And then the stories were transcribed and posted to a website, which was more or less the destination of the Santa Cruz Hip History Project. And recently, I decided to uh, increase the exposure of this painfully collected material from uh, several of the people had in the meanwhile died. So over a period of 14 years, this uh, collection was not getting 
very much attention on my website. For one thing, websites have been more or less replaced by social media, etc. <laughs> And, uh, uh, of course, books are more old-fashioned than websites, but nevertheless, <laughs> logos still exist. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if I've ever sat among a better collection of books than this. This is really, really awesome, and records, too. There, there is a musical side also to the major social transformation of the 1960s. I'm not going to talk about it tonight because I don't have enough time and I don't have the equipment, uh, but I would like to. And I have to say, I've worked so hard for this lecture, but uh, all my time for two months, but not only for this lecture, because I have a course coming up at UC Santa Cruz. It starts in January. It's called Porter 34B, Chaos Fractals in the Arts. And uh, I've given it 10 or 12 years in a row, and every year it has the same title and catalog description, but uh, completely different content. So uh, last year I did psychedelic art, and before that I did abstract expressionism. And, and uh, this year I'm going to go on about the history of light shows in the 1960s, which started right here in Santa Cruz, or rather in, in Scotts Valley. And uh, all the work that I've done is actually preparation for this upcoming course. Well, I will have 10 sessions of an hour and a half to cover this material. So certainly I'm going to cover um, light shows, abstract animation, and the, the music of the times, uh, its evolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But of course, First, I have to learn about it, and I have a long way to go. <laughs> there is so much, uh, so much to it. So, um, for now, uh, let me just uh, be satisfied with this. Chaos theory is about the specific mechanics of major transformations, for example, in history, in machines, in chemistry, and so on. And uh, my idea now about the history of Santa Cruz in the 1960s is up to apply those ideas of bifurcation and so on. So it happens that the events in Santa Cruz, California took place uh, what I would call the period of the hip culture of Santa Cruz uh, spend only the time from 1964 to 1970, approximately. Maybe from 1963 to 1968, I don't know. It was a very short episode, and it had an onset and it had a conclusion. <laughs> Arriving in 1968, as I did, it almost was completely over by then. So considering the mathematical question, how did it start? I had to rely entirely on the observations of other people. Hence, the secret subtext of my hip history project. I wanted to find out from these people who couldn't possibly know how it began, but putting their stories together uh, along with some mathematical ideas and so on, perhaps it could be pieced together. Also, that period came to an end. And I missed that also. I was in India or somewhere the day it ended. <laughs> but again, uh, there were witnesses here who shared their theories about the onset and, and decline of the hip culture. Uh, so then, um, about the book, as these uh, 13 chapters are written from different perspectives of different times and places, you have to kind of piece together all these anecdotes in order to get a picture of what was going on. And even then, uh, the written word, of course, is way, way, way inadequate to 
express uh, that culture. Even uh, a, a book that's replete with photographs, like uh, Holly Harmon's uh, book on the, the Harmony Commune, it, it's very hard to get, uh, to get the feeling of the time. So uh, I, I, I've come up with this uh, theory I want to tell you about, which is not in the book, which is derived from the book, and which I think will be the text of the second volume, where I investigate the idea that the hip culture uh, <coughs> derived from the beat generation by a major social transformation. And what is the step-by-step -step of that? can somehow be pieced together, not just from this book, but from other books of first-person accounts um, written by the participants. So I just want to tell you a little about that. Um, first of all, the, the, the beat uh, culture is very much like hip culture, but it's different. And uh, when you read, read the details, uh, about the beat generation, it's amazing how similar their ideas are even more extreme than uh, hippies wearing tie-dye, living in buses and communes and, and so on. So how did that begin is another question which I can't begin to answer, but I'm sure there are experts. Uh, what I can tell you is that what is generally regarded as the beat generation began with a meeting of three people, uh, KGB. Uh, three people met in 1944 at Columbia University. Uh, K, that's John Kerouac, and uh, G, that's Allen Ginsberg, and, and B, that's William S. Burroughs, Jr. So these three people were sort of the skeleton of the group that, that eventually grew, called the Regeneration. Two years after they met, arrived a fourth important actor, and that's uh, Neil Cassidy. Neil Cassidy hardly ever wrote anything, but he talked a great deal and he influenced other people a great deal. He had a very close relationship with uh, Kerouac and they traveled together. That's the story of, of On the Road and, and the subsequent books. Uh, Kerouac is maybe not appreciated very much now. You can hardly find his books anywhere except they have most of them upstairs right there. <laughs> Um, Kerouac um, wrote 21 books in 21 years, and they're all basically autobiographical, in which he, his own role, carries a different name in each book. And the other characters, they're the same characters in each novel, always carry different names. And it may be fictionalized, or maybe not. I think that probably um, he had a great knack of telling true stories. So one of them, uh, maybe number three or four, called The Subterraneans, was actually written in exactly the style in which, which is sort of a stream of consciousness with almost no punctuation, the style in which Neil Cassidy was famous for speaking. But each of these 21 novels is actually written in a different style, so that you see somehow uh, Jack Kerouac. So The Subterranean was it's a little over 100 pages, written in three days. So uh, obviously the, the drugs, the principal drugs of the beat generation <laughs> were alcohol and Benzedrine. And depending on which one came to the foreground, you would get or not get a book. <laughs> so that's uh, one line, and it also didn't last too long. The, the Beat Generation came out of the closet, as it were, in 1955, when the three principals gave a poetry reading in San Francisco at the newly formed uh, City Lights bookstore of Lawrence Ferland Getty. Um, a French-speaking uh, intellectual from Morocco who had uh, his ideas uh, about media. 
So the City Lights bookstore was the first bookstore in the United States that only carried paperback books. And the Hip Pocket bookstore of Santa Cruz, California was modeled on the City Lights bookstore in San Francisco. So the three gentlemen gave a reading of their work in 1955. And uh, one of the works was a poem by Allen Ginsberg called Howl. <coughs> And this poem, like most of his work, was uh, obscene uh, to a degree. So, of course, it was attacked for obscenity by the law and order people. And because of that, became famous to a level which probably wouldn't, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to read you some of it. Um, because it said, Glenn Howard taught me this, you, you, you can't read this kind of poetry. I mean, you can't read it from a book. You need somebody to read it out loud and then you listen to it. And probably the best qualified person to read Howell out loud is Allen Ginsberg, which he did, of course, not only in 1955, but many times subsequently. And uh, the, there are several recordings on YouTube, so you can hear Allen Ginsberg, so I highly recommend it to at least hear, uh, it's in three parts, part one is about 10 minutes long. You can get an idea of where the beat generation was at in 1955, and thanks to the obscenity laws, he, he was pardoned, the judge said it wasn't obscene. Um, So it came to the foreground, and it ended around 1970, I think, when some of the principals died. And there were a lot of early deaths in that group, primarily because of uh, cirrhosis of the liver and stuff like that. So health problems due to those particular drugs. So all right, I've already used up my time. Uh, let's consider the question then, what is the influence of any between this line, the beat generation, and our line, uh, the hip history of Santa Cruz, California? Well, there is an intermediate line. You've heard about Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. Well, this is another one of these uh, very short stories. Um, Ken Kesey himself said, uh, I'm too young to be a beat, I'm too old to be a hippie. So that quotation from him gave me the idea, well, maybe he's the vector that carried the infection of this particular insanity from the beats into, <laughs> into the hippies. Um, So, before I'm running out of time, I have to tell you the main secret here, and that is in the chemical reaction that turned beet into hip, there was a special catalyst called LSD. <laughs> so this is not just psychedelics, this is particularly LSD. Um, other psychedelics were involved in, in the whole story of psychedelics in the 20th century in North America is important to understand this little bit about LSD. Uh, so the, the mushrooms, the psilocybin, the peyote, the mescaline, the synthesis of these things all in the same laboratory in Basel, Switzerland, um, is, is all somehow, is part of the story and also well told in, in many books. For example, one called Heads, which is about the heads and one called Acid Dreams, which is particularly about the acid dream part of the head story, <laughs> and so on. The LSD story, I think, is particularly wonderfully interesting because of the role of the CIA. Now, I think everybody knows the, how many people know about the CIA and LSD? Yeah, it's, it's well known. So uh, our uh, heroes, like uh, Ken Kesey, like uh, Allen Ginsberg, these people were given 
LSD by the CIA in 1959. So that's way, way back there. That's two years before Timothy, Timothy Leary even heard of LSD. In fact, he heard of it because Allen Ginsberg made a trip to Boston to read Howell and told him. And Timothy Leary, having already established a research project on psychedelics, but it was about psilocybin, said, well, maybe I better try it. And as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> So Kesey's story, I think, is is particularly amazing because on the uh, the charisma and insanity of this one head grew up a whole thing which was the prototype, the experiment which established more or less hip culture as it subsequently evolved. So in just a few years, first he was given LSD in Palo Alto in the Veterans Hospital. Then uh, he was living on Perry Lane, where a group of friends were already morphing into the Merry Pranksters, basically. When uh, Perry Lane was sold to a developer who bulldozed all the houses, so the Timothy Leary and company had to move elsewhere, and they moved to La Honda. And <coughs> the idea evolved. Uh, for the bus trip, and uh, the bus trip was, the idea was to spread the news about LSD to, to, to everyone, to have, to, to jump over, to leapfrog all the media. Um, media in those days, they used to have magazines. <laughs> you know that uh, Gordon Wasson's story about the psilocybin mushrooms in Oaxaca was published as a 17-page spread in uh, Life magazine in 1957. And because of that, a lot of people turned on. A lot of people turned on. But Ken Kesey and his merry pranksters wanted to turn on the whole of North America. I mean, they... <laughs> and, so, and so by making a show of themselves, by transporting what happened in their living room, all across the country and all the way back, they would more or less, which did, turn it all on. They got the idea of having uh, what they did at home on a larger scale that would be a public event called an acid, uh, the acid trip, and uh, the acid test. So there were a series of them, three or four or five. The first one here in Santa Cruz, or rather in Soquel. So the connection between the Merry Pranksters and Santa Cruz is somehow there were about 40 or 50 pranksters, counting the ones on the bus and the others, the ones off the bus. And of those 40 or 50 people, there were seven of them that were for a while residing in uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, one of them, Ken Babs, who was sort of the, the number two of the Merry Pranksters, who took over when uh, Ken Kesey was put in jail. Uh, he lived in Soquel uh, on Rodeo Gulch. So the first acid tip was, was held there. It was almost exactly 51 years ago. So the 50th anniversary was celebrated a year ago here in Santa Cruz because of a county supervisor who was sympathetic to uh, the acid test. <laughs> and uh, so it happened that <coughs> the genesis, the, the, the seed, the germinal event, in uh, Santa Cruz, California, was the opening of the Hip Pocket Bookstore, owned by who else? Mm -hmm. Two pranksters, <laughs> and Ron Bevert and Peter Demma. And um, Neil Cassidy uh, helped out in the store, and the store was used as the staging ground, uh, giving people directions how to get to the first <coughs> acid test. Then um, Cassidy brought in his uh, friend and housemate, Leon Tabori, who started the barn. So this was in, uh, the bookstore opened in 64, uh, first acid test in 65, the barn opened in 66 when the bookstore closed. And <coughs> the barn became a stationary acid test. It was there every day 
every night, 300 people, stoned mostly on LSD, weird music, psychedelic art, light shows by Dr. Richard Smith, the dentist in Scotts Valley. <laughs> and uh, this became the, the nucleus of hip culture in uh, Santa Cruz. But, alas, I tell you the story you already know. So maybe I'll stop here and ask for questions. So I've run out of steam. There was uh, so much more. We need an encyclopedia to get it all down. But does it matter? So, frankly, I think it does. How do you think the internet fits into all this? Well, yes. Uh, the internet um, is a technological development which has had transformed our uh, planet and added to the biosphere, the noosphere, and it's like tremendously important. What is the relationship, I think you're asking me, between the, the internet and the World Wide Web and... Um, Chaos. Well, super consciousness that comes from uh, the spiritual aspect of the psychedelic experience. Uh, well, no. I think it's very important in itself and it's also kind of a distraction mm -hmm. from uh, spiritual development. So people take psychedelics for uh, spiritual advancement or they take them to party. So there's kind of a spectrum of what, what can happen when you do these things. And as Leary gave instructions for set and setting, you see the merry pranksters were not interested in set and setting. Uh, they, they were more on the party side. They scorned spiritual development. I think it's similar with the internet and the World Wide Web. It can be used for this, it can be used for that. Now when it first started, around 1994 is when I personally became aware of the World Wide Web because one of the uh, lead technicians up at UCSC just happened to find out about it early. So I uh, created a website in 1994. It was only number 300, what, there are now like 300 billion. I don't know, there are a lot of nodes on the internet and I had one about number 300. So I got on there early and uh, then because the university was immediately trying to control what kind of material I posted there. I started my own web service bureau that required a level of expertise and technology beyond mine, but then we had these experts up there, some of whom were very sympathetic. So the reason I had this service bureau was not only for myself, but I wanted the spiritual organizations worldwide to be able to get on the World Wide Web before it was taken over by major multinational corporations. So, dream on. Uh, but we did, you know, uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, monks and sanctionaries, Zen, uh, you know, all, all these meditation. I, I tried to uh, get these people online as soon as possible because the internet, the World Wide Web, could be miraculously empowering to the spiritual growth movements worldwide. That was the idea. And now you think of, of all the material out there, if you, if you search for any topic, anything that I've mentioned, you know, some weird kind of uh, um, Zen meditation or walking meditation or something, you, know, you find abundant information. It is all there. It's buried under everything. Else. But if you search, it is there. So I think very likely the World Wide Web uh, possibly can do more good than harm. There's also there all this bomb making instructions and 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 so on. So I think it's uh, supportive, but I don't. Uh, I think that the noosphere, as envisioned by Teilhard de Chardin, and uh, in my own dreams of the future of this planet, involves more the, the this direct mind to mind, the telepathic, the precognitive, the you know the the uniting of uh, individual consciousness into cosmic consciousness, something like that. 
which um, is possible for some maybe small groups of people, but I don't see a, a, mass, a mass movement. Um, anyway, it's proceeding apace because there are a lot of meditators and uh, I think that that development, a spiritual development, is more important than the World Wide Web in the long run. I'm sorry I killed that question. <laughs> killed all the questions. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes. The ones from the book? Can you repeat it? I didn't hear it. The question is if we still have the audio files that were transcribed into text to make the book. Not only we have them, but they're where? They're where? They're on the web. So uh, my, the, the, there are two websites where you find this material. One is called ralph-abraham.org slash 1960s. 1960 little s. And the other one is called uh, Jacob uh, hipsantacruz.org. Hip Hip so uh, that material is there and also a lot of other material because there are other things that didn't get in the book. As a matter of fact, let me take this opportunity to say I'm still collecting the oral history project of uh, hip history of Santa Cruz is not over. I'm collecting materials. Uh, what I have collected, uh, several new pieces have already been posted on these two websites. And uh, also, some of them will appear in a subsequent book, assuming that I ever get the money back invested in this book, which I think maybe in any case, probably uh, a second volume will appear. For one thing, in my opinion, we had inadequate representation of feminine voices. I mean, gender is still gender, and especially in those years, there was a great deal of, uh, of sexism, of gender bias, which affected that culture and which gave birth to the women's movement, which followed in the 1970s. And uh, that transformation and those developments, I want also to be better represented in the second volume and therefore we will allow, you know, we will accept material and publish uh, stories that belong entirely to the 1970s as well as the 1960s. Right. Ralph, I'm, I'm interested in that barn you talked about. Where was yes. that? Did you ever go there? Oh, of course. That's why I came to Santa Cruz. <laughs> I, I, I came to Santa Cruz to look at UCSC and interview there. I'd been offered a job and I wasn't really interested, but before leaving town, somebody tipped me off to the barn and I went there and that's uh, there and then decided to move to Santa Cruz. <laughs> I, I, I gave up my professor position at Princeton to be nobody at, in, in Santa Cruz and, and really have a life. Where was the barn? Well, the uh, f photographs are there in, um, in our website. Roger? Mount Herman Road? Off Mount Herman Road? No, it's Highway 17, Scotts Valley, turn off Port Sangatilly. South Storage there, where the barn Near Santa Claus Village. Yes. Ralph? Dang. What, after all of this time and reflection upon the, this sub subject, what do you personally think is happening when one does LSD with regard to the internal uh, biochemistry of that individual person uh, and their energy fields and the rest of the universe <laughs> and, and whatever exists outside of the physical limitations of the universe? What do you think is happening? Yes. <laughs> we should accept answers from everybody in the audience. It, it, it is highly individual. And I could only uh, tell you about mine. And there I had uh, been seeking an answer to that question just in the context of my own personal experience uh, from the time of my first trip in November of 
1967 until now, and I have made you know a lot of writings about it, but it probably doesn't coincide to anybody else's experience. Let's see, Bob. Uh, well, I wasn't mm -hmm. going to answer that. I was going to say something else, if I may. First of all, thank you, you for may. bringing us all together here. Mm -hmm. This is a great tradition that we have in the STEM. Coming together, Paul's kept it going with the Penn University for all these years. Um, the group, the Santa Cruz College, started last year that you and Danny and other people have spoken at and that we could really get together in this town to talk about this stuff. We have a really can you, can you hear back there? informed and, and community about this incredible thing, the, the beat movement morphing into the hippies and the importance of psychedelics in our culture. And, you know, I've been involved in that. And I'm more um, unsure than ever as I've kind of deepened my inquiry into this. You know, we talked a little bit about the CIA and the kind of common um, narrative that we accept is that these guys, TZ and Ginsburg and Burroughs and Leary, um, were turned on basically by the CIA. And this beat hippie counterculture movement was sort of blowback or kind of uh, not what they had intended. But my recent research is indicating that actually <clears throat> the CIA was much more involved in maybe even cre deliberately creating a counterculture that would kind of, that would have that radicalized what was going on in the 1960s. And it's a very challenging subject to talk about because there are many individuals, yourself, Danny, I certainly have a lot of people that had this incredible breakthrough from the psychedelic drug. But for the most part, what has their effect on the culture been is something that I think we should gather more and look at, you know, critically and understand this. Like you mentioned Lawson and that Life magazine article. The common story about that is that <clears throat> that was Wasson's independent research. But that's not true. It wasn't Wasson's independent research. Wasson was, was funded by the CIA. The CIA had deliberately intended to popularize that hitherto obscure mushroom and create this psychedelic movement. I think that's a really astonishing fact that has had my head spinning for quite a while. And, um, <clears throat> well, this uh, reminds me of the Bavarian Illuminati. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I, I, is it possible that there's no Illuminati of, uh, I'll say, four or six uh, humans in the Alps somewhere who make plans and then they, uh, they draft the CIA by fooling and hypnotizing and create, uh, or, or, or is it some uh, uh, alien, alien civilization or uh, gods and goddesses and so on? So I, I have no idea. I think that it's more likely that things don't even evolve in time, but only are as they always were. And if you try to cast them into an evolutionary scenario, then there are many different stories are possible. Uh, so I don't know. My own work, you know, it culminated in a book called Demystifying the Akash, where I have a, a, a discrete model of cosmic consciousness, more or less, based on Kashmiri Shaivism where I think maybe this is completely wrong. And uh, I think that mystical literature in general and the literature of the uh, Himalayan Hindus in particular is derived from uh, meditation, from tripping, from tripping and then trying to express the experience and then generation after generation these people spend six months out of the year locked in a cave in the Himalayas and then they integrate their information and then the mystical literature comes down to us in a form which is very difficult to interpret, like the Bible or whatever. And uh, I find this uh, particularly Kashmiri Shaivism to be very uh, conforming to my personal experience, which of course is different from anybody else's experience. But in my trips to India, this is what uh, comes down to me, the same question you're asking, but in the context of India, has to do with the gods and goddesses, that is, they're called gurus. These are people who were alive, who achieved a special status called guruship, and then they died, and then their soul went up, and up there is this millions and millions of these uh, souls. 
which is called Gurukul in India. It means the school of gurus, like a school of fish. Now, in the Gurukul, there are certain ideas which are popular, and um, schools that are powerful, and they beam them down, giving people ideas like yours that they think they thought of themselves, and therefore act upon. I don't believe this, but this is the Hindu version of you. There's no CIA in it. There's a guru cool. What, what do you believe? I, the question I asked you, I don't want to be over legalistic about this, but I, I asked you a question, and you said everybody's got a whole lot of different answers, and you've got one too, but what is it? What is your... <laughs> What is your understanding of what you think is going on? Yes, well, what I think is going on, uh, what do I believe about my LSD experience? I think that, um, which might be completely wrong, because my LSD period was... to do that on purpose. <laughs> so the um, meditation, that's not me, right? That's somebody else. Someone else is playing. It's a girl's school. Nimgaroli, give me a break. Um, my psychedelic period was a long time ago. So immediately after a trip, I couldn't even, I couldn't tell you, but I could kind of remember something, but it doesn't at all fit in words. So now years later, I have to say the image, my memory of what uh, happened to me has been to some degree replaced by theories that have been de developed um, by me and also um, toxified through mystical literature from India or, or wherever. But this idea I find attractive, that there is uh, a community of minds, a kind of, a, this is a model of consciousness, as it were, where there's a big uh, cloud, uh, like Emerson called the Oversoul, and uh, there descend uh, from it um, these pods that come down that are kind of individual consciousness and throw through that cord of dissension we have a contact with this cosmic consciousness and going through that from one individual consciousness to another. And this kind of model is supported by experiences that we call in this culture paranormal, like telepathy and so on. Now it comes to the more difficult paranormal experiences like precognition where there's a dislocation in time then this can also be accommodated by a cosmic consciousness kind of model, a noosphere model, by supposing that it doesn't actually have ordinary time <coughs> there. It includes different times in one package that we can slice through with our limited consciousness, which only has three dimensions, etc. That kind of thing. So I'm not the only one saying this, but among all the things that other people are saying, this is what fits my experience best as far as I remember it. Now, in the instant of having an LSD trip or with somebody else, which uh, mostly I did mine alone, but with somebody else, there's naturally um, an impulse afterwards to ask this question. It was your experience anything like mine? And usually the answer is, is no. Like Terence McKenna and I, for example, do a DMT trip together and I see all these lights in which uh, ordinary time is subsumed in some kind of big soup. What is Terence's experience? He's talking about elves from outer space that are climbing down a four-dimensional matrix. <laughs> so I think that we've had the same experience, but I think it doesn't fit so well in uh, language, and his aptitude for putting things in language is very much different from mine. I tried to, uh, uh, since the advent of computer graphics, 1974, at UCSC, I have tried to use 
abstract animations based on models from chaos theory as a way of sharing the visual aspect, like a lower dimensional projection of vague, this is vaguely like, what I have seen is vaguely like this, you see. And uh, there, there are many computer graphic artists out there who are trying to use the technology to share what they have seen. If they're visual people and they have uh, the strongest aspect of the psychedelic experience they had is a visual aspect, and then they use this abstract technology with mathematical models. It's, I mean, it's amazing how mathematical models fit behavior of the physical universe, like the model for the solar system. Equally, it's amazing how mathematical models can also fit the inner experience, the inner universe. And uh, so there are a lot of people, I l love to tell this story that in, uh, was it in the San Francisco Examiner, I think it was claimed by a technology consultant that uh, LSD had no role in the computer industry. <laughs> you laugh, having experienced this, but uh, the woman who was convinced this was true went to a meeting of SIGGRAPH in Las Vegas where there were 30, 40,000 computer graphic professionals and the minute she got off the plane, she started asking people right in the airport, are you going to the SIGGRAPH conference? Yes, well, do you think that LSD has had any influence on your work? Resounding yes. So she was defeated. So that was in the 1980s, I think, and I am not sure this is still true, but I, I, I think probably did. The popular press is telling us that 40% of the people alive in the United States today have had an LSD experience. Ah, oh, is it possible? I don't know. Just on background, uh, I had an uncle who had a schizophrenic break the day I was born in 1937. He was kind of like this ghost in my life, through all of my, my life until I was in high school. And there were medications that came out that allowed him to control his brain enough to be out in public. I finally met him. I had only known him through his writing and his art. And I think that that was, you know, that was the early 50s, and I think that helped to lay the groundwork about, oh my God, there's something we can do about some of this stuff that we can't, we haven't been able to deal with. And LSD was part of that, that sort of opened up that, that door of saying, let's see what we can do. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like any kid with a new toy, they weren't thinking about what you can do with it. And, um, I had migraine headaches when I was out of college, and they were giving me something called Sansert, which was made from non-toxic derivative of LSD. It was coming out of Switzerland. This was in 1962. Um, and you know what happened was I had dreams that were like Salvador Dali, and Walt Disney got together, and I figured I could have made a fortune if I could have put it out on, on it, it, you know, in some kind of some kind of uh, perfect, you know. But it's our curiosity that gets us there. It's our, it's our, it's our sense about <clears throat> wanting to step outside of what we already know. It's, it's the impulse that gets kids from out of their crib. You know? and yes, that's, well, that's, a, that's an important part of this, to, to just recognize that impulse. And this is just one tool that's used. Well, the, me the medical applications of psychedelics is a hot topic uh, today. Uh, but I think, un unfortunately, it, it tends to uh, uh, co cover up the spiritual aspects, which uh, I don't know. I don't know. Necessarily the answer, but it, was, yeah. but it explained what was going on. Yes. Is there an origin theory for complex dynamical systems? An origin theory for complex dynamical systems? Mm -hmm. No, I don't, not to my knowledge. So uh, what is the, uh, uh, the development from what of complex dynamical systems? So this kind of mathematical model has evolved in the field of mathematics through the efforts of mimicking, modeling, or simulating natural systems. And it's the natural systems which are 
the complex dynamical systems that have inspired all the mathematical models. Uh, for example, the double pendulum is a pendulum that's hanging from a pendulum. And this pendulum swings, and then this pendulum swings with its fulcrum being swung by the upper pendulum. So this is a complex dynamical system with two nodes, two components. Two simple dynamical systems are connected through actually gluing one part of one to some part of the other, you see. So if we excuse mathematics for taking it its uh, origin in the natural world, then your question has to be, how do complex dynamical systems in the sense of natural systems, how have they evolved in the history of the universe? Uh, and uh, that we don't know, it's just kind of the natural order of things, that they tend to complexify to a certain degree, and then if they complexify too much, then they don't have survival power, and so they complexity backs up, and then you end up with the kind of things we see. We have um, fractals abound in, in nature, the clouds, the waves, the litter on the forest floor. Uh, the positioning of trees in the forest. If you compute the complexity of each of these fractals, you find that they're in a certain natural range. Similarly, the complexity of the heartbeat, of the uh, electroencephalograph, and, and, and so on. Um, evolution in nature has favored complex dynamical systems within a certain range of complexity, I suppose. The question is, is there a way to work backwards from the state of a complex dynamical system to find out how it started? Is that more or less what you asked? Yeah. I thought point Carré was a reference point for you. Uh, yes. Well, um, the, the, the problem is that each uh, system is embedded in other systems, and unless we consider the entire enchilada, we can't begin to answer that question. And so there are some a theory like the Big Bang, for example, is just a fantasy because, uh, hey, that's a long time ago. <laughs> so many different scenarios can be invented as potential answers to the question how it all began. And uh, some people believe it never did begin, that it's more or less endless. Oscillating process. Like I think maybe we have exhausted everybody. I just wanted to bring up the fact that there's a book that just came out recently um, documenting Mary Meyer's relationship with JFK. Do you know about this? And uh, kind of, no. Well, there's a movie called The Presidential Affair, I believe, that was based on it. Cord Meyer was a big CIA guy. And of course, uh, Mary had an affair with the, Mary was a young girl who knew Kennedy forever since she was 14. Then eventually they fell in love. We're supposed to get married. He, she was turning him on to LSD, in other words. And it's all online now. It's Mary, I forget the name of the book, but it's Mary Meyer. M E Y E R. Well, this uh, fits in with Mary Bob Forty's Bay, theory. Right? That it's Peter's book, yeah. There's a, there's a terrific book on this um, that gets into it in some detail called Mary's Mosaic. Okay, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Tim Leary uh, and the film. Also, you know, Tim Leary wrote about this in his autobiography, first kind of leaked this story. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, Tim's autobiography, Flashbacks, um, tells this for the first time. Um, and it's a very interesting moment. I'm, I'm writing about this now myself. I went through Tim's archive with him, we were friends, looking for, you know, Tim was um, prone to tell what his best friend Frank Barron and he used to call Irish facts, which are facts, which are stories that are not exactly true, but interesting. And so this Mary Meyer story, a lot of people doubted this for quite a while, because Tim never told anybody at the time, and he wasn't the kind of guy that kept secrets. But it's a very interesting moment in history, and if you look at 
uh, JFK's speeches mm -hmm. during this time. You know, he was elected on a kind of Cold War platform. He was his father's son. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, you know, the Russian, we got to get him, we got to be stronger. And then, you know, kind of gradually and then all of a sudden, especially <coughs> right around the time of the peace speech, he was certainly talking like he was a mystic and about the unity of life and he bypassed the CIA and his authorities and went right to Khrushchev, I guess you're talking about the Vatican, yeah. and uh, started, to, yeah, started to create a whole new, you know, um, mentality. Going to do away with the Federal Reserve. Well, let's uh, get back to the spiritual yeah, realm here because the political <laughs> aspects. Um, hip, hip culture in Santa Cruz in the 1960s was more in the spiritual direction with our moon festivals and our magical music ceremonies and so on. I'll have one. being used, being taken out of various things because it would predict things that were perhaps unpredictable that they didn't necessarily yes. want to have predicted. Even the Dalai Lama could be corrupted. I, I think uh, two more questions and then we'll quit, okay? Uh, so I've been working a lot with um, plant medicines and indigenous cultures, and I've been having a really difficult time kind of bridging the gap between like the psychedelic movement of the 1960s and LSD and everything that happened at that time with this kind of like native ancient cultures who have been custodians of this kind of wisdom, deeper spiritual wisdom or psychedelic you know, pharmacology. So is there anything that I can kind of like, that you could guide me into saying that helps kind of bridge the gap between those two worlds? Like one lady came up to me and she was of, of Peruvian descent and she was saying like, psychedelic, I, like, I don't even understand this word. And, I was trying to tell her that, like, as Westerners, we kind of went this more chemical route to get to these same kind of principles. Is this the, the right answer? Or, like, how do I bridge this, this lineage of the 1960s in the U.S. and then this, you know, like, native historical ancient knowledge? Well, there was, there's, you know, the primordial religion of our species, uh, sometimes called shamanism. And the spiritual and medical use of uh, psychoactive plants had its roots at least 30,000 years ago in this shamanic religion. Those uh, in, in indigenous healers, uh, like in the Amazon or, or Siberia, these are derived from, these, these are the rare residuals from this ancient religion. And uh, the psychedelic awareness in Santa Cruz in the 1960s was very aware of the shamanic connection. Uh, there were visitors from different cultures who heard about Santa Cruz and came through. Many of them stayed in my house on California Street. And we tried to give them a platform so that the courses were offered weekend workshops and so on in these many, many different uh, traditions. And our own rituals were um, somehow derived from them. Uh, this has to do with the musical connection also. We have um, a jazz that has a blues roots. It goes back to New Orleans and, and so on. You can trace it all the way back to the drum rituals of uh, primitive shamanism. So it's all part of the same tree. Uh, one more, you, sir. How would you say that uh, when you're talking about manifest itself today? Could you r repeat, please? Yeah. How do you think all the things you're talking about manifest themselves today in our, in our society, the larger society in the United States and the world? <laughs> well, yeah, there's uh, the United States, the world, uh, the world that we live in today, uh, we hardly know what it is because it's being misrepresented on a massive basis by the media. But when we talk to young people, we, we learn that, that there is uh, extensive use of, uh, of DMT 
derived from plant fibers available on the internet, etc. So enormous number of people are having psychedelic experiences today and it's never, never mentioned in the media. And maybe the CIA doesn't even know. <laughs> no. So I, I think uh, th this is the, the time to draw a halt. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm very grateful to Logos for making this uh, space available for us to meet. I wish we had a larger space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.